Thank you so much, Professor View, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here with colleagues here at Williams College, in the, in the Religion Department, the Latinx Studies Department, uh, this year and next, and to share in these uh, lectures uh, about a topic that I've been thinking about, as I mentioned last week, uh, for a long time. So I'm going to get right into it um, and share with you my latest reflections on putting the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Pedro in conversation. Last week I posited that because 20th century Puerto Rican independence movement leader Pedro Alviso Campos, 1891-1965, was referred to as, quote, Apostle of Puerto Rican independence or Apostle of Puerto Rican liberation, I should put him in conversation with the better known apostle of the Christian Testament, Paul of Tarsus. I reviewed the life and times of Albuiso Campos, including some of the religious influences that drove him toward demanding independence of Puerto Rico from the United States, which he identified as an imperial presence. Albuiso was a devout Roman Catholic who thought that Spanish Catholicism had, be, had been reconstituted into the Caribbean over the centuries, creating a nationalist Catholicism that was a source of identity and culture for Puerto Rico as well as other Caribbean islands and also Latin America. In fact, Arbuizos tours of other Latin American nations in the late 1920s as a spokesperson for Puerto Rican independence also sought to align Puerto Rico with Latin America instead of North America. His was a vision of a more historically accurate Iberian-American identity, as he called it, for Puerto Rico, which would disappear, however, over time under U.S. auspices, he believed. We learned last week how Albuiso's essays and speeches during the 1930s galvanized the island's efforts toward independence, but was stopped in its tracks by pushback from U.S.-appointed government and police forces on the island, including violence against organized independence protests. By 1937, Albuiso and several other key nationalist leaders were arrested, convicted of sedition, and sent off to federal prison in Atlanta. Albuiso did not return to the island until 1947, but by then the forces of an intermediary status for Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth status, were strong, led by the first elected governor of Puerto Rico in 1948, Luis Muñoz Marín. For the next three years, Albuiso spoke eloquently, forcefully, determinately against this move, ultimately deciding with other members and participants in the Nationalist Party that an outright revolt would bring attention to the cause of independence more than anything else. The efforts, which turned violent, failed and Albuiso was once again arrested, sent to jail for almost the rest of his life. Thereafter, cries for independence lost ground in Puerto Rico, and in fact, statehood has gained greater force, although not enough, given the economic hardships on the island, especially recently. Many in the U.S. Congress, which has ultimate power over what happens in Puerto Rico, shy away from supporting statehood from this still culturally distinct Caribbean island. Thus, the status, the freely associated state, the Puerto Rican constitutional name in Spanish for the English term Commonwealth, which Muñoz Marín argued would be temporary, remains. Albuiso was right in the estimation of many today, including your 2022 Krogan lecturer. Freedom would be elusive unless it was complete. Now, what does all this have to do with the Apostle Paul? So we turn towards several themes in my proposed dialogue between Pedro and Pablo. First, there's a question of empire. Pedro Abuiso Campos was clear in his denunciation of what he saw as the imperial presence and practices of the U.S. in Puerto Rico. Albuiso understood that what had happened in Puerto Rico at the turn of the 20th century, he understood that as an act 
of imperialism by the U.S. government. A comparison of Don Pedro's claims about what he called Yankee imperialism with the more circumspect, circumspect references in empire to empire in the Apostle Paul's letters is instructive. During his travels in Latin America in the late 1920s, to explain the Puerto Rican situation, Albuiso described an imperial agenda in U.S. actions in Latin America for over 100 years. Albuiso described U.S. presence as Puerto Rican nationalism sustains that there exists for more than a century of systemic imperialism by the United States directed until recently exclusively against Iberian American nations and presently marching through a worldwide Yankee hegemony, end quote. Moreover, he continues the current military occupation of Puerto Rico in one, is one of many instances of North American imperial events toward the South, and this innovation should be seen in the global aspect as a continuous war against our nationalities. Strong words from someone who was reflecting already against, about U.S. action against Mexico, about other such incursions, and now in the Caribbean, and as well as Latin, the rest of Latin America. So for El Buiso and his cohorts in Puerto Rican nationalist movement, what drove U.S. imperialism was economics, backed by military force. He argued that the principles of human rights have little influence on the imperial soul, quote, unquote. This is a conviction that was based on the devastating impact of U.S. economic interest, including the private sugar corporations, which have succeeded in converting previously successful cash crops for local landowners such as tobacco, coffee, pineapple, and others into one sugarcane. My father was a sugarcane worker before he migrated to the United States. U.S. controlled exports and imports such that local interests could not make shipping deals with any but U.S. interest and its exorbitant cost. These and other dynamics of empire in the Puerto Rican story, with cultural and economic hegemony, argues Puerto Rican historian Mario Ayala Santiago, secured the imposition of North American empire, along with fellow other insular associates, to install a new colonial system. And arguably, that colonial system stands to this day. The terrible economic crisis in Puerto Rico to this day Unfortunately, but predictably, only the U.S. can intervene to fix it, given Puerto Rican status. What does Paul say about empire? In his most well-known text, Romans 13, 1 to 7, thank you, Lito, which stands before you, this text was infamously used in recent years by Attorney General Jeff Sessions to support family separation policies on the U.S. border. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. And you can read the rest. Neil Elliott, in his study of Paul's letter to the Romans, The Arrogance of the Nations, reading Romans in Shadow of Empire, includes among his list of features, the attempt to win hearts and minds through a prop propaganda project, as, as well as sheer military power. Empires seek the consent of conquered peoples through violence and persuasion. One aspect of Rome's imperial project was convincing the conquered that they could not rule themselves and needed the benevolence of Rome. Rome claimed that the Pax Romana achieved through violent military conquest was a gift indeed to the universe and only they, the Roman imperial order, had the virtue and valor 
to secure and maintain for all the world to enjoy. Rome too was driven by economics in search for conquest and colonization, writes Eliot. Quote, the cost of conquests were normally borne, however, by the imperial treasury, meaning by the slaves, peasants, and laborers who actually produced the wealth Rome appropriated through taxation. And the luminary supported this. Cicero, for example, said, liberty was the privilege of imperial people, and only their subjects had no inherent right to be free of Roman, Roman rule. I was reminded in reading that description by Cicero, quoted by Neil Elliott, the insistence that Abuiso Campos had for the rights and freedoms of Puerto Rican people as a matter of natural law, self-determination, and human dignity. Therefore, in the previous text from Romans 13, one wonders what was Paul thinking in writing these words in the latter part of his long letter to Christ believers? Earlier in the letter, after all, Paul had written to urge non-Jewish and Jewish believers to alike to see their faith in Christ as a justifying and reconciling force, not a divisive one, Romans 5. He called upon them to live out their baptism as a sign of a new life, Romans 6. Not only is their life renewed in Christ, wrote Paul, but is empowered by the Spirit of God, this in the face of the imperial power that surrounds them and enslaves them. Yet in Christ, Paul argued, there is no enslavement but the power of the Spirit, Romans 8. When it comes to talking about the Roman imperial order, however, more directly, Paul seems to support empire. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and those authority that exist have been instituted by God. Pedro Aguizo Campos, for whom we have no record that he ever engaged this text, might have argued, who said empires are appointed by God? Empires practice terror, which is not of God. It seems, however, and this is what Eliot argues, that Paul was calling for order in a way that did not disturb the peace for Christ's followers internally. As Eliot argues throughout the letter to the Romans, Paul presents God as the arbiter of what is justice, not Rome. Yet Romans 13, 1 to 7 sounds so much like a prescription for letting any government do unjust things to people, and certainly that is how it has often been deployed, including recently during U.S. anti-immigrant rhetoric. Yet to understand Paul more fully in this and other contexts, we need to look at what comes next. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For one who loves another has followed the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. 13, 8 to 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is fulfilling the law. In some sense, Paul argues that despite what we owe empire, we owe each other as believers in Christ, whether Jew and Gentile, love. Moreover, Paul continues, it is God who ultimately vindicates that empire. And very soon he, he, and very soon he believed. Besides this, you know what time it is. How now is the moment for you to wake up for sleep, from sleep? For salvation is nearer to us than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is over. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of God. Perhaps Paul has no illusions about the Pax Romana, the rhetoric about peace and security. Indeed, a peace and security brought about through violence and force. Paul believed the empire to be temporary. So non-resistance seems to be his answer in the letter to Roman Christ believers. They should practice subject, sub, subjection now as temporary measure, for in due time, all this is passing away. However, there's a problem in Paul's eschatological view of the need to resist empire. The fact that he himself often incorporates language of empire and hierarchy, lordship, 
to impose his will and exact obedience from his communities. For example, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, some local leader or ex leaders are exercising their freedom in Christ through prayer and preaching. However, Paul wants a cap on these public displays, especially as exercised by women in the community. So toward the end of the letter, he writes, For God is, not, is a God not of disorder but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in the church. This is a stinging rebuke to women's agency in the Corinthian ecclesia. And Antoinette Clark Wire has shown in her classic study, The Corinthian Woman Prophets, that even earlier in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul had argued from the rhetoric of the order of creation to similarly curtail women's leadership in the community. And there are other indications, of course, that women did participate fully or actively in the Pauline mission, but apparently when his authority was threatened as in corn, he would reinscribe, as Elizabeth Schutzler Fiorenza has taught us, imperial, hierarchical language to exact obedience in local communities among women and men. Arguably, again, Paul's eschatological vision and its urgency was also evident in these instances. A soon return of Christ, he would argue, necessitated such obedience and towing of the line by members of the community. Perhaps, Neil Elliott argues, in a world with no real unrestricted freedom, no sense of democracy, equality, and the rights of the individual, Paul had few options. In contrast, in a different time, Pedro Albuiso Campo with his legal training and religious sensibilities for human rights saw clearly what was wrong in US occupation of Puerto Rico and demanded independence, nationhood, and freedom, even if it had come through revolt. For Paul, ultimate freedom was in Christ, yet to be revealed in all its glory at the return of Christ. In the meantime, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he told the Roman Christ assemblies. Make no provisions for the flesh, that is, for life as we know it now, because eschatological salvation, liberation, Deliverance is nearer to us now than when we became believers, but it is not to be in the here and now. Another feature besides empire I want to discuss with you tonight in comparing Paul and Pedro is the issue of citizenship. In 1917, the U.S. Congress Jones Act enacted two major pieces of legislation in Puerto Rico. U.S. citizenship for the residents of the island and limiting shipping rules with regard to how the now U.S. citizens on the island could do business, no one but U.S. interest. These strict limitations told did not even allow Latin American ships to port in Puerto Rico without traveling first to a U.S. southern port, unloading for reloading on a U.S. ship. You can imagine the cost of such action. And yet these draconian rules were suspended only briefly after Hurricane Maria in 2017. No, 100 years after the Jones Act was enacted, for a couple of weeks, it was suspended after the horrific realities of Hurricane Maria. Today they're still in place. But this other matter of the Jones Act, citizenship, as far as Arbuiz Ocampo was concerned, denied the reality of Puerto Rican citizenship and therefore nationhood. When the US imposes its citizenship upon Puerto Ricans, it seals the status as colony, argues Arbuiz Quote, it is a denial of our natural citizenship, he wrote in 1930, our natural personality. As non-U.S. citizens, eligibility to fight in World War I was not a reality, a possibility. The Jones Act made it such. But it also denied the fact of Puerto Rican national citizenship and nationhood, and such is the force of empire, 
argues Al Buiso. It is an encroachment on a free nation, he writes. It, quote, it atomizes, makes it an atom, small, the nationality of occupied peoples. Granting citizenship to occupied peoples rather than a sign of freedom constricts them because it takes away that which is naturally theirs as a free nation. So only complete political independence restores that natural state. Otherwise, uh, uh, we so concluded in this statement about citizenship he wrote in 1930, this colonization under this empire, the United States has wrested away our values. I'm struck by that phrase, wrested away our values. What did Paul say about citizenship? The book of Acts, of course, written decades after Paul's death, suggested that Paul's status as a Roman citizen facilitated his travels across the empire to bring good news about Christ to the nation. Yet Paul himself, in his letters written mostly in the decade of the 50s, does not discuss his citizenship status in the empire. After all, Roman citizenship until the 3rd century CE was difficult to come by. It usually depended on birth and elite status and could be purchased by the most loyal, well-to-do, established families of the empire. That Paul never mentions it as a status he inherited or purchased probably means he didn't have it. Moreover, when he does mention it, he minimizes it, especially in comparison to identity as a Christ believer. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, a Christ community in one of the most Rome-aligned cities in in all cities in all of Macedonia, Philippi, Paul writes, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross. I have often told you, and now I tell you even with tears. Theirs is and is destruction, their God is the belly, their glory is their shame, their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship. So a contrast between an environment of Roman citizenship apparently, a contrast that says that Politumia is in heaven. It is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that enables him to make all things subject to himself. Again, as in the Romans 13 passage, Paul references his ap ap apocalyptic worldview in light of some apparent Philippian overemphasis on Roman citizenship. He's trying to put the latter into an eschatological perspective, and in so doing, he suggests Roman citizenship is based on a system on its way out. In contrast, Christ's believers will eventually experience a more glorious citizenship that is heavenly and secured by God in Christ, to whom all will ultimately be subject, not the Roman Empire. So Paul exalts a different kind of citizenship and thereby diminishes, at least in the eyes of his cohorts in the Christ Ecclesia, Roman citizenship. Yet, this is not a major topic for him in most of the rest of his, the Pauline corpus, as it eventually becomes in the narrative about him in the second half of the book of Acts. Empire, citizenship, a third topic, please, imprisonment. The imperial instrument of silencing resistance. Richard Cassidy, in a 2001 study, Paul and Chains, Roman imprisonment and the letters of Paul wrote extensively about Roman imprisonment and what might have been his impact on the Apostle Paul, who by his own admission and in his letters was imprisoned various times and not just one, the final time according to tradition in Rome. Cassidy shows the horrific physical setting and consistent threat of execution that made Roman prison a violent tool against any kind of resistance. Thus. Wherever Paul was in prison, whether in the colonies during his travels or in the imperial capital, at the end of, of his life, death was always around the corner of any imperial cell. So again, a passage from Philippians is instructive here. For I know, through your prayers and help, that the Spirit of Christ, this will turn off for my deliverance. And we learned from earlier in Philippians 
this being his imprisonment. It is my eager expectation that I will be not to be put to shame in some way, but that by speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, but that's far better. But remaining in the flesh is more necessary for you, he argues. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. From his prison cell, apparently, not sure whether a final imprisonment in Rome or an earlier one, Paul connects with his Philippian cohorts by suggesting that while Roman imprisonment brings a threat to my life, he hopes for release and an apostolic visit to Philippi. That he hopes for release and visit in spite of the rhetoric of heavenly reward may be a matter of making an emphatic connection, a paphos, with his Philippian community. We don't know if he ever got to visit Philippians after writing this. Moreover, the record is silent, even in Acts, about when and how Paul finally died, except for later traditions. That, those traditions have him in a Roman prison, under guard, then executed, perhaps by the Emperor Nero, sometime around 64 or 65 CE. In the story of Abuiso Pedro Abuiso Campos, two imprisonments curtailed his work and then his life. In the 1940s, he spent from 1937 to 1943 in a federal prison in Atlanta. We have exchanges from the ACLU trying to get him out because of a bad trial in Puerto Rico in 1936. In the 1930s, as I said before, strong and positive progress toward independence ended with this long first imprisonment. The effort of a revival of that effort in the late 40s when he returns came too late and was too violent. Imprisonment for Albuiso the second time in the 1950s led to illness including a debilitating stroke in 1956 that literally silenced his voice. He spoke no more after that. He died in 1965, April 1965, shortly after Governor Luis Muñoz Marin, almost as a final act as he finished four terms, four four-year terms as governor, he pardoned Albuiso so he could die at his home in San Juan. In short, friends, Imprisonment has been a tool of umpire to control freedom fights. But what was the liberation movement that Paul led? It was apocalyptic as far as he was concerned. It was eschatological. The gospel movement could not go against empire directly because the latter's powers would yield to the divinely driven soon return of Christ. So Paul argued believers should receive a spiritual liberation, work to do good for each other, wait for God to intervene in a final way, liberating believers from those oppressive structures. In contrast, Pedro Albuiso Campos, while a devout Roman Catholic, deployed his Caribbean-based, Puerto Rican-defined Catholic faith that we talked about last week and problematized a bit. He drove it, nonetheless, toward action in the here and now, for Albuiso Campo, the eschaton was political liberation that needed to happen as soon as possible. But like Paul, he too gave his life for that cause. What have I learned from these interactions between these two apostles? I've learned to define apostleship more broadly. I'll tell you what I mean. Recently, I, I told my Puerto Rican, Costa Rican dentist about my research on Abuiso Campos and Paul as apostles from two different centuries. And he asked, 
wasn't Paul a saint? Implying that maybe a priest wasn't. I gather he didn't like much talk about independence movement or that part of Puerto Rico's history. I shouldn't be raising that issue as he's about to do some work on me, but nonetheless, <laughs> he's an old friend. And I wanted to tell him what I was up to. I responded, well, yes, he became a Satan, Catholic tradition and some traditions, but his initial designations included this act of being an apostle, which originally meant quite simply a missionary, a sent one. And in many ways, I added, yes, to Dr. Gonzalez, my good friend, I said, and I think Alvisa was an apostle in that way too, an itinerant preacher for the cause, in his case, of independence. And right on cue, one of my students this week, commenting on my lecture in our class discussion forum, a uh, lecture from last week, suggested that's what she learned apostles were. Travelers, this is her term, travelers across borders. Now, some of that came from my essay in Dr. Hidalgo in our book, my essay on um, Paul Islands and Borders. But I was glad to be reminded of that simple, broadly defined approach to apostleship. Apostles are travelers for a cause, and certainly Paul and Alviso were that. What about empire and freedom? What have I learned? Nothing new, perhaps. Empires are brutal. We're seeing that play across, play out across overseas in the last few weeks in horrific ways. But the, the categories of empire that play out across the centuries are often consistent. Reading in Ashcroft, Griffin's Tiffin, The Empire Writes Back, Theory and Practice in Postcolonial Literatures, for example, they cite the language of control and hegemony, such that language itself, quote, becomes the medium through which a hierarchical structure of power is perpetuated. Truth becomes restructured and realigned for the good of empire to the detriment of the people. They also describe the reality of place, and then displacement as part and parcel of what empires do. The disorientation, the alienation, and the crisis in self-image that results from colonization, enslavement, forced migration, and refugee status. These are signposts of empire across the centuries, and they are evident in Paul's time and in Arbuisos. I've been thinking that perhaps the U.S. Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, the development of liberation theology in Latin America and black theology in this country, one can dream has helped to mollify to some extent the imperial mindset and practices that Guiso Campos attacked in terms of U.S. 19th century and 20th century reality. It, however, rears its head, that manifest destiny, regularly. The Reagan and Trump eras are examples. And so if U.S. imperialism stopped the freedom movement in Puerto Rico dead in its tracks in the 1930s and beyond, a progressive movement needs to stop any right-wing, some white supremacy tendencies in our era that rear their heads. Finally, hermeneutics. I started to think about that with you all last week. How do I make this move in biblical hermeneutics as I have in these last two lectures, crossing centuries with two very different people in two very different worlds with arguably limited written evidence, much of it in rhetoric of the key figures? That is Paul and Pedro. And I thought about being more specific and analytical than I was last week about this. But the reality is, as I've reflect, reflected on these issues again and again, and including the last few weeks, I've come to the conclusion that I cannot do anything but, as a Puerto Rican Bible scholar, 
Now that wasn't the case decades ago, three decades ago, not that long ago, when I began this journey with traditional biblical training in graduate school. But I think Elizabeth Schutzler Fiorenza, Fernando Segovia, among many others, have been saying it well for several decades. Biblical scholarship must not avoid flesh and blood readers in an effort to practice some kind of distancing, objectifying, exclusivist, scientific exegesis. The human and social dimensions, the what for and the so what of these exercises and research must be part and parcel of our work including in biblical studies. So if I'm not taking my community, in my case, my Puerto Rican roots, religion, and history, into account, para qué? For what do this work? My context and my culture and my person do and should dictate questions raised and directions taken. And that, of course, is the stuff of post-biblical, post-colonial biblical analysis. And I'm nothing if not a child of post-colonial reality, a reality that is, however, in many ways, a, still a colonial reality when it comes to the island of Puerto Rico. So I'm going to keep raising these kinds of questions, these strange comparisons, and learn from them and share them. And tonight, I invite you to help me with this work in progress, we have a little time, with any questions and comments you might have, but in particular, beyond this evening. Thank you so much for this time. If you have questions, comments, thank you, Lito, for helping me out here. I want to get my water while you think. Please. Thank you very much for this. I, I guess I'm left being struck, as I often am, by how frustrated I find Paul's writings, or I am by Paul's writings, in the sense of when you put them up against a Buiso Combo's Paul doesn't look very good to me. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't look like he's pushing back on empire. He looks like he's adapting the idioms of it and holding on to it. And not that the voice of compost is, you know, we problematize the Iberian and Catholic kind of, um, kind of framework. But I guess I, it makes me wonder sort of what it does for your thinking about how unsettling it can be for it. You're familiar with the work, work on decentering Paul. Like so, what what does it do for thinking about the status we give to apostles at all? Not just broadening the notion of you know apostleship, but even how we hold up apostles as exemplars. Yes, thank you. So um, mentioning decentering Paul. So I a piece I wrote about Paul in commendation, where he has these passages where he commends. Uh, local leaders, right, um, based on my dissertation years ago. And I and it showed up in one of the volumes of the Paul and Empire series that Richard Horsley uh, uh, organized in the 90s. Um, uh, and more recently, in the uh, Fesh Drift in the Works for Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenz, or another one, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I was asked to talk at that uh, Presentation, initial presentation, um, and I saw, sort of went back to, oh, the occasion of her uh, presidential address, so this was Schuster Ferenc's uh, 1987 presidential address, so this was 2017, it was being uh, remembered. Um, uh, and I dug deep into the presidential address, I dug deep into her work on Paul, and the whole issue of re reinscribing Paul, uh, Paul reinscribing imperial language, patriarchal language, hierarchical language, uh, and I went back and looked at my piece on commendation, which commends Paul for commending local leaders, and I think I need to rework this whole notion of, of uh, Paul as uh, the ultimate leader, the ultimate apostle, because of these, and, and the text we cited from 1 Corinthians uh, 14 is problematic. So, uh, decentering Paul is exactly the agenda for many of us who've been studying Paul. 30 years uh, and, and, and reinscribing him 
as the center uh, of what happened in early, earliest Christianity. Um, uh, and so I wrote in, in, in that essay that I would rewrite that commendation piece and think about the persons he didn't commend. And who's left out of those lists? Uh, yes, he's using the, the rhetoric of commendation in eight passages. Uh, in, in six of his seven uncontested letters, only Galatians doesn't have commendation, and we know how angry he is in that letter. In that letter. Um, so I think I need to revisit these sort of celebrations of apostolic work of Paul. And, and thank you, yes, our brother Luis Ocampo and the way he addresses empire within his own limitations is helpful uh, in thinking about that. Um, uh, but I don't have other, other than revisiting uh, and remembering in contrast of Romans 13 uh, with 1 Corinthians 14 and saying, he's, he, he says, let's, let's follow the, the empire to stay out of trouble while, while it's being passing away. But at the same time, he uh, uses imperial language to limit the roles of women and, and others in his congregations when they don't agree with him. So that is problematic. How can we, we follow up, please? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it, uh, thank you, by the way. Very uh, uh, good follow up to last time. Um, I guess I'm trying to think about what the, the uh, Abueso and Paul's relationships to borders mm. uh, 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 is, and whether or not there's a distinction there that might be worth uh, drawing out a bit more. Because it sounds like on your description that uh, even as Abueso is going across borders to uh, 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 make his case, uh, uh, he's making a case for borders. He wants the Puerto Rico mm. to have more definition and not be subsumed. At least this is my understanding from what you've been saying. Um, and I wonder if Paul has an equivalent thought there, uh, and what his sense of borders then, I mean, he's also crossing borders, but it seems like also in some principled way against borders. Although, uh, from what I gather and what you're saying, uh, uh, there are also ways in which he has all sorts of distinctions he wants to continue to make, and that he reinforces uh, 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 in his efforts. But so I guess I just raised that to, to hear you say a bit more about their relationship to borders, since in the case of uh, um, uh, Abueso, there is this sense of wanting to have the integrity of the place that would give it uh, uh, a sense of definition that would value borders and particularity mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a certain way that at least I think requires interpretation and saying more in, with respect to Paul. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. Um, so in terms of the borders set up by Rome, because you know there's recreated borders, right, that oftentimes uh, deny the kind of uh, nationalities and ethnicities and even languages that are in order to make th those borders, those provinces uh, uh, suitable for military uh, uh, control and management, right? So I don't think Paul uh, pays attention in that sense. Uh, you know, he, he writes to the Galatians, uh, and we're not sure if he's writing uh, to a uh, particular, the, the Roman province of Galatia, or he's writing to ethnic Galatians. You know, there's that, that sort of uh, confusion and mix uh, in how he addresses uh, peoples within his communities. Um, uh, I think he's recreating, and he uses the term ecclesia, right, the sort of assemblies. So he's, recre he's, cre he's creating communities that do, in fact, cross borders, ethnic borders, as well as the, the geographic limitations of the Roman imperial uh, order and borders. Uh, but then he creates sort of uh, 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 borders uh, about do's and don'ts uh, in terms of how the community should behave, how they should, they should relate to him as the ultimate authority uh, besides God. Uh, and so uh, there are borders in terms of relationships that he creates in his uh, stipulations and expectations for the communities. And, uh, uh, and a lot of that, I think, uh, I, I 
um, I, could, I continue to argue, is related to his sort of belief in, a, in an ultimate border crossing in terms of uh, Yescatan that, you know, I think influences everything he's, he's trying to do so that if he uh, draws dark, uh, tight borders around be, uh, relationships and behaviors within the communities is because of his concern about that ultimate border crossing uh, eschatologically. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, I, I just think that there are uh, actual borders that he cares less about in terms of the Roman imperial order, and then there are the borders that he creates around behavior given the ultimate border he wants folks to cross with him. Thank you. Please, and then we'll uh, go back there. Yeah, thank you for this wonderful lecture. So can you say a bit more about the concept or definition of natural law yeah. that either Abuisa Campos or you are drawing on? So you mentioned this natural law several times when you were talking about citizenship. And um, is it the early Christian concept of natural law? Is it the later Western philosophical construction? I'm thinking Rousseau or Hobbes. Or is it possibly also an indigenous critique of the Western philosophical construct of natural law? I'm reading this new book, The Dawn of Everything, which is very interesting. It's, it, it deals with this topic centrally. So I'm just wondering whether Abuisa Campos, that's really what I'm you know, curious about. Well, thank you for that is question. Because, natural definition? Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think I have the answer about what Abuisa thought about this. Because uh, as I suggested last week, uh, so, so he, he, he uh, shows up at Harvard for, you know, for uh, his undergraduate work, and uh, in Cambridge, he somehow rediscovers his Catholicism. Uh, 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 um, uh, and and ac uh, according to several scholars, r reads deeply uh, uh, into Roman Catholicism. And, and then he connects with it, uh, including notions of, uh, of, of, of natural law and uh, 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 he, he connects with it as, an, as a clue, as an answer, as a foundational piece to uh, what he thinks should happen in Puerto Rico, and that the notion of uh, natural law and uh, 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 Catholicism as expressed in Puerto Rico, uh, re-expressed in Puerto Rico, should be one tool, not the only tool. Right? He's, got, he's got law, he's got uh, uh, political uh, understanding, he's got anti-imperial understanding, uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, uh, Roman Catholicism and, its, and the convictions about it, what it becomes in local expressions, including indigenous expressions, uh, frees the people to exercise their identity, to the extent that he finds that, right, and, and we need to excavate, I need to excavate more, you know, or what, are the, what are the problems with that? Uh, um, but to the extent that he finds that uh, in his uh, use of natural law uh, in his study of Roman Catholicism, uh, he latches onto it. And he's very devout, and very uh, idealistic, and almost romantic about uh, uh, Hispano Catholicism as expressed in the island of Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on uh, digging deeper on, uh, uh, on his understanding of of natural law from his understanding of, of, of Catholic teaching. But it is, it is that that influences him, I think. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for a very original, insightful talk. I never thought of Alviso Gapot in those terms. Uh, my knowledge of biblical scholarship is close to nil, so I'm going to ask you because of, about Alviso as a political figure. You know, there is in Latin America a whole current of uh, claiming Hispanic Catholicism as, a, as, as, as the true ideology, as a way of fighting liberalism and secularism. Uh, what's called Insulada Raza Hispana. Uh -huh. And I can't help but see Albizu within that current, except that, of course, it has a paradoxical, it's a, li it's a liberation movement, it's an anti imperialist movment. Uh, it's an anti what movement? Anti liberal, anti imperialist movement grounded in Catholicism, mm -hmm. which is quite unusual. I don't know if you could, if you talk, talk Albizu within, within that context of Hispanic Catholicism as, as, a, as a formation that's fighting liberalism and secularism, but also fighting, in this case, American imperialism at the same time. 
No, I, I think that uh, uh, there's a contradiction, no, in, in Albuiso, in latching on, like I was saying, into this rather conservative vision uh, of what Catholicism is and can be in the Caribbean setting. Uh, and no doubt, well, I, in his travels to Latin America, he captured some of that as well, although we're talking about the 20s and 30s, so I don't know uh, if, if the more recent developments that you're maybe referencing. Uh, but he, he, he has these sort of uh, moments where he raps uh, uh, eloquently and uh, 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 with high rhetoric about the importance of, uh, of this uh, Caribbean Catholicism, right? Uh, and I don't know how, to what extent it's, uh, uh, he, he was influenced by Latin American thinking about this, but the Caribbean Catholicism, he latches on to it as something that needs to be defended, protected, uh, fought for as part of the larger independence uh, uh, effort. So um, I think, you know, you're right that it corresponds to that kind of uh, uh, notion in Latin American Catholicism and that it's conservative. It's, you know, uh, um, uh, romantic in many ways for how he writes about it. Um, and um, I don't know if over time, if he had survived and, and uh, reflected more about uh, its conservatism, if he would have, uh, I mean, he did draw a line a few times when uh, particularly North American uh, Catholic leaders came to Puerto Rico and he challenged them for, for example, uh, allowing the American flag to be uh, in front of the uh, cathedral in Ponce at one point in the case of uh, uh, Cardinal Spellman. So, you know, he, he, he didn't shy away from challenging the church, but he seemed to have this sort of, this sort of uh, uh, idealistic perspective uh, that may very well come from this, this movement that I know less about than uh, your suggestion uh, around Bible. Say that again? Sure, yeah. No. No, from what I read, he, you know, he, he, uh, he denounced uh, class divisions, he denounced racism. Uh, um, he was not at all, uh, um, I would say, conservative about those issues. Uh, so, so very much in a, in a, in a liberal tradition, uh, but the Catholicism piece was, uh, and I think it was all part of this sort of what can I, what ideologies, what philosophies, what religious thinking can help me build the case? Remember, he's a lawyer, right? he's trained as a lawyer. So what can I use to, to build the case for uh, the independence of Puerto Rico? And if a, a, a nationalist, as he described it, nationalist understanding of Roman Catholicism in Puerto Rico can help me say, this is why we have to preserve our identity and our nationhood for religious reasons, for political reasons, for legal reasons, and for human rights reasons. I'm on the list, uh, you know. So I, I wouldn't say, he, no, at all that he was a uh, conservative in politics, uh, uh, but that statement of the, the, the Catholicism was a, a rather conservative statement in his, in his writings. Thank you. Jackie, please. Yeah, I wanna, um pick up a little bit on uh, Denise's first question and maybe from another angle. I think you all know that I'm interested in decentered Paul from a completely other perspective, which is um, a kind of, a, you know, that for me, and, and you know, we had talked a little bit of this, about this after your last lecture. I'm interested in thinking about this term apostle and, you know, what we kind of get out of putting Pedro and Pablo in dialogue in terms of how people made them apostles mm. and the meaning of the word apostle. And what what do you think, like, I mean, you talked about expanding the term apostle, but also what, what do we sort of get by seeing the dynamics of not so much who these men were, or who they ignored or didn't ignore themselves, but what people have done sure. with them uh, and putting that in Congress. Yeah. And I would argue that in many ways, whether it's the Book of Acts or later tradition, apostle becomes, right, this hierarchical uh, 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 appellation rather than this kind of activist <laughs> suggested at uh, um, you know, uh, this sort of missionary impulse uh, over against this sort of formal title, uh, including the 12, uh, 
And, and, and even Paul references it in 1 Corinthians 15 where, where he says, you know, I'm like the least of the apostles. So already it's becoming this kind of uh, exclusivist uh, term. Uh, so when people use it against, uh, like my dentist, right? Well, he was an apostle and a saint too. So there's this sort of uh, de deification, if you will, a reification of Paul uh, that the tradition uh, did soon. Um, uh, with, including with the term uh, uh, apostle. Uh, so it's absolutely a term that becomes an, uh, applied, right, in, in, in hierarchical ways. Um, uh, it'd be interesting, and I haven't done th this work, to go back and, you know, to the sources that, in the newspaper articles and uh, in Latin America. Because this is where it really, when he made his travels in the late 20s, Pedro uh, Abuiso Campos, all over Latin America, and, and, and the newspaper says, here's the apostle of Puerto Rican liberation in Puerto Rico. You know, uh, it, it is there where the, the thing takes off. In Puerto Rico, he's known more, more as an maestro, right? He's a teacher, right? Because of his, spe his speaking and, you know, and uh, but in Latin America, for, you know, the, the term apostle became applied to him. And the, the, the task is then is to go and say, well, what, what were they thinking? You know, but of course, these are newspaper articles, right? Sort of, you know, sort of the journalists sort of thinking about him. But what was, what, what, what was the mindset? I don't know, you know. Uh, but I suspect it's the same idea of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, this, uh, his, this historic, traditional, um, um, uh, reification title uh, being applied to uh, Pedro, except that for him it was the journeys for independence where the title emerges. So he is ap apostolic small a in terms of being a, this traveling itinerant preacher for uh, this cause and this movement, right? Um, but what were they thinking? Uh, it's worth uh, it's worth a look. That's really interesting. I actually didn't know that the term really first emerges when he's in. Say that again. When it, I didn't really know that the term first emerges when he's on like the road, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, so that, that's also an interesting way of thinking about it. It's not a term that's applied to Albizo Campos when he's in Puerto Rico that's correct. by other Puerto Ricans. That's correct. It's a term applied to him. Um, when he's traveling, when he's outside, when he's both in diaspora in the United States or, you know, mainland the United States or in uh, Latin America. Okay. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So it could be, a t you know, it could be in many ways, he, it goes back to his origins, right, of the, the, the sent one, the, the, the one who hits the road for a cause. I, I think that's, uh, um, it may be kind of a, uh, I dare not say it, but I will, a kind of revival of the term and it's sort of, uh, root meaning when it's applied to this traveling itinerant preacher for Puerto Rican independence as opposed also, to what it became. There's also some parallel though. You talk about journalists and their labeling. I mean, at, what is ACTS but an example of that kind of journalism, sure. yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's a problem there. Right? Yeah, yeah, it seems like there's a really tight parallel there that you could build out even further. Think important. about Jackie's original question about the reception of them as apostles, right? And, and that also, if I could just kind of build on that and also back to Jeff's question as well. I was so interested in, in hearing you talk about citizenship. Yes. And especially this, this idea that Aviso Campo, that he, he was adamant you know, against the idea of Puerto Rican citizenship. And thinking about, about Paul, and especially the, the way Paul in narrative sources is sort of you know, Kiwis Roman assume and so forth. I can walk anywhere in the Roman Empire and, and because I'm a citizen, that gives me the, the freedom to do what I'm doing. But there seems to be a really interesting kind of tension around this idea of, of citizenship. So I have lots of questions about it, but maybe I would start with even just, you know, how, how common was Aviso's position even among Puerto Rican nationalists? Like, how, was there a division about whether citizenship was a good sort of temporary step or was everyone adamantly opposed to it? Like, how is, how is the idea of U.S. citizenship even constructed in the movement uh, in that period and then later? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it happens in 1917, and then uh, he, he himself, interesting, I, this needs uh, some reflection. Uh, we, uh, I, I flashed a picture of him in, in his uniform. He himself volunteered in 1917, so after, I believe, the Jones Act, 
and the beginning of World War I, he volunteered for the Army. He, you know, and so what was that about? Because in the 1930s, it's already he's denouncing, right? Or as soon as he gets back to the island, right? So he, he finishes in Harvard, he finishes his Army stint, he goes back, because he never got deployed. He was in the States. He goes back to the island, you know, as a country lawyer, uh, and then he joins the Nationalist Party. Uh, soon enough, rises the ranks. He's vice president of the party when he travels to Latin America representing it. When he gets back, he's made president in 1930. And then, you know, those, that, that, that series of essays from 24 to 36, where he's writing newspaper opinion pieces and all of that, is where he rails against citizenship, clearly. Uh, uh, what the rest, uh, and, and since he's the president of the party, he may have had pushback on it, but I don't think so. I think it's not, a, it's not, a, uh, a, a pleasant thing. Now, I always sort of, you know, think about this when, for example, in the Hurricane Maria where people were saying, how could they treat us like this? We're citizens. You know, when there was neglect of what was happening on the island. And I said, is that really the argument you want to make? about? The, uh, but, it, but, but for Puerto Rico, it's become, you know, a, a, a stamp. You know, why are we voting for presidents? We're citizens. You know, that, that, uh, but I don't think that's the rhetoric you see early in the 20s and 30s, uh, soon after uh, the Jones Act. Particularly, and this came to me as I was rereading the Jones Act, I said, wait a minute, they coupled the citizenship for World War I uh, conscriptions with limiting even further the shipping rules. Because, of course, uh, you think that you are now a citizen and you'll be free to have these sort of economic liberties. No, you won't. So uh, I think that from the beginning, the citizenship piece uh, did not sit well. Did not sit well with the Nationalist Party. Um, and, and, um, and it wasn't until really the 40s when the option of another alternative status for the island besides independence or statehood, because that was in play uh, early as well. Uh, when this other status came, then citizenship became, OK, you know, we're citizens. Uh, and we are a commonwealth, so we're getting closer to something. You know. um, well, he's traveling to Latin America. He's doing it on a U.S. passport then in the 20s, yeah. right? Yeah. So like Paul on a Roman passport, yeah. as it were. Right? I mean, there's just something, really important. Interesting, about that. something yeah. interesting about what citizenship entails and the privileges of it that, and how he takes advantage of those versus some of the rhetoric. It's really, I mean, I think it's interesting in its own right, but especially in relation to Paul, right? Especially in relation to the framework that you set up, because that's a part of the relationship to empire that, that you know, is really interesting in the way Paul gets constructed. I mean, less so maybe in his own writings and more in acts, but still relevant to the, the reception of Paul, at least, as an apostle. Great, thank you. Yeah, maybe to pick up a little bit on the idea of the construction, I'm curious how are you, I mean, given that you're sort of There is something to the martyrdom that adds, sort of lionizes even more, right? The martyrdom of both. I, I think, I mean, Paul, there's always, I think, are there, I, I'm not a Paul expert, so I, or, I mean, I'm just wondering that the ends is part of the message, the, the message of each of the messengers. The end? Their ends. So you have Abisu who dies, I mean, I, there are all these speculations also about cancer that was sort of all this other stuff, right? His mystery, his, his illnesses, radiation, right. all, radiation. Kinds of, all kinds of mystery shrouded. Uh, so there, it, it is a, they both had, I, what, was Paul beheaded in Rome? Well, that's what the tradition says yeah. later on, but we have no evidence. Right, that, yeah. so the, the, that's, the, that's the punctuation of both messengers, right? So I'm just curious if that's something you're thinking about, just, I think the ends are always interesting to look at. Because I think that's part of the construction, right? These are lives that, in many ways, died, they both died both for their faiths. Uh, in the book of Acts, of course, uh, Paul uh, is left alive at the end. He's been dead for, presumably, for 20 years uh, when uh, Luke, when the author of the book of Acts is, writes his narrative. Uh, uh, Paul is alive and kicking at the end of the, the narrative of the book of Acts. And he's not even under, he's, he's under, some kind of loosey-goosey house arrest instead of, you know, sort of in, in a Roman uh, dungeon. So, uh, so uh, Acts has a whole different, you know, 
uh, mindset about the end. The end is, you know, we, we just keep on preaching. <laughs> you know, we just keep on sharing. We've arrived at Rome. We've arrived. We're in Rome. Uh, and, and we just keep on uh, keeping on. So that's the end for the, the, the author of the book of Acts, uh, that we just keep going. Um, uh, but by the second century and beyond, the tradition catches up, you know, with some level of, of truth in Paul's demise. And indeed, we don't know how or why, but sort of uh, makes it uh, extreme, right? Uh, that, that in some way parallels that of Christ, right? That's sort of huh? part of the, myth, the, myth of, the, the mythologizing. Yes, the mythologizing. The examples of Christ sort of martyrdom. That's right, that's right, yeah. Sir? Just a casual reflection on the matter of the word apostle. By the way, the Cuban freedom fighter is known popularly all over the continent as the apostle of freedom. That's right. So the word is probably used much more loosely than, than, than religiously. Sure. It, it's more You're talking about Jose Martí. Exactly right, yeah. Jose Martí, right. Yeah. Yes, although, you know, Martí is also another one of these people that's been made into a kind of saint of or sanctify. Yes, that's true. Oh, yeah. He is practically San Jose. So. He is, yes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You're right, yes. <laughs> Friends, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate it. They've really been helpful. And we'll keep talking. Thank you. Good night.